This conference will now be recorded. I didn't wait for the uh, the record thing to come in, so I presume that's okay now, Andy, is it? Let's carry on. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Brilliant. So uh, yes. thank you, Andy, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for everyone that's joined tonight. So we will, over the next hour or so, uh, go through the, the projects that I've led and been involved with at Cowley Bridge. So I see Dick is on the call, Dick Watts, and uh, I see a number of other uh, colleagues and friends that are on the call. So very grateful for their time and for their dialing in. So just going to take you through a number of slides. There's around about 40 slides, and it'll just give you a chronological view of where we've come from and uh, what we've done to get a demountable defence uh, installed at Cowley Bush Junction. So uh, without further ado, I'll go into the slides and uh, probably quite uh, evident from that slide uh, as to what the issue is at Cowley Bridge. So it's not a new issue. Water has been uh, living alongside or we've been uh, living alongside the rivers at Cowley for uh, the entire duration of the railway's existence here. And uh, when we go through the next couple of slides, you will see that this is not the first time that we've had an issue here. Uh, and it certainly won't be the last. So this picture is from the 2012 event and you can quite clearly see just how much water is at the junction. So for, for those who are not familiar, we've got here the picture taken from Cowley Bridge itself from the overbridge. So you've got the Barnstable line off to the left, diverging and converging on the left there. Uh, just about the only bit of trap that isn't underwater there. And then you've got the Great Western Main Line to the north, uh, veering off to the, the right of the picture there. So what we are supposed to be seeing here is two railway tracks on the main line and a single line for the Barnstable. So water is quite clearly uh, trying to get from one side to the other. So that red line there just indicates where there should be and is a flood relief culvert. So uh, what we've got here is just an example of uh, what barriers we've had in place previously at Cowley. Uh, you can see these aqua dams uh, is their official term, but quite uh, commonly known as sausages. Um, very difficult to inflate, very difficult to erect in times of flood. And clearly, when we've got a flood incident, there are other pressures on the railway. There are other pressures on our staff, on our resources. So you can see here just the, I don't know whether I can point on here, I think I can. Uh, I think I can point to the middle and you can see where the, the aqua dam has twisted. So that should be all the way across the, the railway corridor there in a continuous line, but has clearly twisted. So uh, it's not particularly effective, although it's doing something. So I'll just move into a little bit of the background here. Um, so as I said, Cowley Bridge is in Exeter. Uh, it's just located a couple of kilometres north of Exeter St David's, so uh, a very critical location for both the railway and also for uh, the local populace. So that's the junction of two major roads as well. Um, oh, just got a bit of noise out. Just uh, would appreciate if someone could go on mute. Thank you. Uh, so we've got. Uh, yeah, a number of things that happen at County Bridge. So the picture there just is very clear that we've got a lot of water in the area. But in terms of <clears throat> the water courses, we've got the, the River X, which is what gives Exeter its name, the city of Exeter its name. And we've also got the River Cree. So there are various distinctions on maps, uh, which we'll come into later, that confuse those two. But effectively, we've got the railway sat in a floodplain probably because Brunel thought the land was cheap, probably because he thought it was easy, and I guess the landowners weren't too worried if uh, the railway got flooded. So it is absolutely uh, probably the worst place to build a railway if you're thinking about flood resilience, if you're thinking about preventing railways from flooding. So we have, uh, as Dick would testify to, and as a number of colleagues here would testify to, we have had a number of flood incidents over the years. We've had ballast washouts. We've had all sorts of damage scores to the infrastructure here. Uh, probably most uh, significantly in 2012, where we had 
a number of washouts that affected also the signaling cables. So signaling cables are very susceptible to flood water, uh, especially ones that are probably not as new as they could be. So back in 2012, we had the railway shut for something like five to six days whilst we repaired just the signaling cables. So the ballast went back in probably three or four days, something like that. The cables took the, the other two or three days. So it really is quite critical that uh, at this location we've we've got to do something effectively so we'll move into uh, a couple of bits of uh, further background now but what we've delivered as part of this project is a demountable defense which replaces the existing aquadam so uh, thank you dick for the picture um and your help in the research of this so Again, the first picture was 2012. This is back in uh, the autumn of 1960. And you can just see there the significant amount of water that is around uh, Cowley Bridge. So that picture is taken in exactly the same place as the one on the first slide. So main lines to the right and Barnstable line to the left. You can see there that the, uh, the line to Barnstable was due at that time. And this was prior to the, uh, the Exeter flood scheme, which was developed and uh, progressed through the, the early and the mid 1960s. So uh, for those that are uh, aware, you've got a bullet specific on the front there. Uh, it's nice to see the signal box as well. That is now just a concrete base, unfortunately, but uh, it proved very handy to store materials for us. So uh, yes, it's not new. And flood relief schemes are certainly not new either. This just gives a bit of historic context and also uh, explains a little bit more around the flood scheme that was done in the mid to late 1960s. So this is something that uh, is quite difficult to see on the screen uh, unless you've got it very close, but you can just about appreciate the diversion of the River X channel and also the diversion of uh, further channels to the north. So there have been a number of attempts over the years to control, to manage and to uh, try and reduce the incidences of flooding in Cowley Bridge. But I think it would probably be fair to say that uh, whilst we have had some success, it is uh, probably going to be a bit of a losing battle at Cowley Bridge. So we're in the situation where we've got to accept we are going to get flooded and we need to be uh, a buzzword here and um, sorry is is more resilient so we do need to be better at responding and we need to have a robust plan in place so one of those mitigation measures is the flood defense uh, that we've installed now so effectively what that does is it allows us to be more mobile and more agile when we do get flooded that actually we can deploy the barrier as late as possible so that we delay as few as trains as possible and then have the barrier up for the flood event and take it back down again as quickly as possible so just to give you an idea and appreciation the last time that we installed the the barrier uh, which was in a trial in the possession that's not actually been deployed in anger yet which is uh, good was 40 minutes to get it up from turning up on site opening the storage container and then putting it out. So 40 minutes is, is pretty good. Uh, in reality, it's probably gonna take more like an hour by the time everything else is sorted, but it is uh, compared to the old system, which was two to three hours, if we could get the right couplings and if we could fill it up successfully, uh, it is quite a big benefit in terms of staff safety, the efficiency, getting it up and getting it down, which obviously reduces the the impact to train services. So, as I said to you, on the first slide, we had a very clear picture of a lot of flood water, uh, and this is now obviously in a low flow condition, but this is underneath the, the main line, and you can just see here that this is the flood relief culvert. So, flood relief culvert from 1896. I did have to find the, uh, the the picture in the archives, the, uh, the, the builder's plate there. So um, it's certainly not new, this problem. And uh, you can see just the amount of repairs that we've had to do over the years. So it's also got the central strengthening column there. 
Uh, unfortunately, which is good, we've managed to repaint the underside of this deck because obviously it is subject to a great deal of flow in winter conditions. So, yeah, that's just to show that it really isn't a new problem at Cowling. So I've talked a little bit there about some of the railway backgrounds, some of our issues with flooding, uh, but as always with these things, when it comes to drainage and flooding, it is part of a much wider scheme and it's part of a much wider solution here. So whilst this has been quite a major undertaking for Network Rail, this is just a very small part of the Exeter City Flood Defence Scheme. So a multi-million pound programme uh, EA delivered, so uh, Environment Agency have taken the lead with this, and they've involved a number of partners, so Devon County Council, uh, Exeter City Council as well. And effectively, what it delivers is a one in a hundred year uh, return period level of protection for the city of Exeter and also the outlying areas. So, the very eastern extent of the flood defence scheme has been and is Cowley Bridge so you can uh, appreciate from the pictures that were provided earlier that there is a huge hole in the railway uh, which is the underbridge so the overbridge location uh, and you can appreciate that with the new defences in Exeter which are effectively a mixture of flood walls of uh, demountable barriers down on the quay side and uh, other channel works that actually without this barrier at Cowley Bridge, the scheme is effectively invalidated. So I'll come on to some, some more detail a little later, uh, and I promise there are some visuals just to, to aid understanding. But effectively, without the barrier at Cowley Bridge, it would have been the case that there was a hole in the defence, and that would have allowed both Exeter St David's, the signal box, and also around about 90 properties uh, that would have been flooded without this. So it is a critical part of the extra flood defence scheme. Um, and if you do want to get some more background, I won't play the video now, but I've left it in there as an embedded link. So there is a government and uh, extra city council video on there, also available on YouTube, I think. But you can click through to that just to get a, uh, a visual for what happens during a flood event uh, and what happens now. So. We are now moving into the, the the phase where I can describe what we did as a team. So this this very much was a team effort. Uh, I happened to lead it up, and I was very lucky and uh, still feel very privileged to have led it. But this was definitely headed up by a, a number of people um, from various organisations. So. In terms of just some of the key background, some of the budget figures there uh, for those who are interested on the financials. So project was around about half a million pounds budget. Uh, it was slightly more uh, to start with, but we ended up spending around about 480,000. So I'm sure there's still some final bills to come in. And uh, I'm sure we're probably fairly close to that original budget. So the whole scheme was around about half a million. As you can see there, we ran through from May 2019 with the programme through to May 2020. So we were uh, we were very lucky in a way to just uh, catch the first bit of lockdown and uh, the first um, stages of COVID. Otherwise, I think this could have been a very different story and we would have probably been looking at some uh, prolongation and some delays uh, more than we had. So the barriers came from uh, Germany. So Flood Control International provided the barriers, as you can see above, but it was touch and go as to whether they could get them here uh, for our possessions. So I'll just go into uh, each of the suppliers. So all of these suppliers have had an input and it's been great to work with the teams from the various suppliers. So ACOM were brought on board to do the flood risk assessment. Um, initially, they were intended to do the detailed design, but for various CMP reasons, uh, which I won't go into, we've ended up using Crouch Waterfall for the design work. So the actual defence itself has been designed uh, in detail by Crouch Waterfall. Track design there, as it says, 
Balfour BT Rail, uh, who also helped to deliver the, the main civil works as well. And then we've got some of the subcontractors. So Flood Control International, based in Tavistock, uh, supplied the, the barrier system itself. So that was the, the drop boards and the uprights. And then I, I really, really want to emphasize that actually the, the subcontractors that we had working for Balfour BT were absolutely superb. So uh, MMP, uh, Total Rail Solutions and Protec, they really did a great job. And um, without those guys and the rest of the team, we would have struggled here. So uh, I do really appreciate the help that uh, we got from, from everybody. Uh, and it really did feel like a, a collaborative effort. So we'll move on to uh, a couple more background and location details, just so that we get that real appreciation for where this is in, in the River Valley. So left hand side, you've got a little purple blob that shows you where the site is. So you can see there both the junction of the, the A396 and also the A377. So we're just at the point where the River Creedy and the River Colm confluence. Uh, and you can see that it is definitely a pinch point. So I think I can circle this on here. Uh, I should learn how to draw on these things. because uh, I'll muck it up. So you can see here that without this defence in place, there are a number of residential properties on the way down into Exeter that would have been at risk. And also, probably more importantly, for the Southwest's construction trade and also for rail projects, Exeter Riverside Yard is located just at the bottom of this screen. So there is a virtual quarry there. There's all sorts of stockpiles and materials. And actually, cutting that off would have been a pretty uh, disastrous thing for us to do. So getting the defence in at Cowley Bridge during those times of high flow really does help us. Right, uh, so we just, we will, I promise, get on to some really exciting pictures and, uh, and show you some of the, the, the more interesting stuff. But I think it is just useful to, to set the context here. So the barrier, has been set at 15.58 metres above Ormond's datum. And that is a really critical figure because that is the, the number that we managed to get out of the flood modelling and also consultation with the Environment Agency around what would be acceptable to both ensure that we protected the railway, but also didn't cause flood risk to others. Because as you appreciate, causing flood risk to others, especially neighbours and residents, is not really something that A, we want to be doing, and B, is actually uh, not in line with the environmental permitting regulation. So it was really important that we had that, that figure agreed up front. So we spent probably the best part of six months with the Environment Agency through various meetings, reviews, workshops with ACOM, uh, and all, all of the EA staff and the, uh, the Exit Depot offices just to get that level and that number so that is really critical so when you see the defense uh, a little bit later on in the presentation you probably would observe that it could be a little bit higher um, but we've set it at that level 15.58 to make sure that we've got that balance between providing a benefit to the railway but also not affecting other landowners and other stakeholders so this will become very clear in a minute, but you can see there on the third paragraph that we've managed to get some passive provision into this. So something that I'm always really keen on is to build passive provision into all of our schemes. Not always possible, sometimes ends up costing a lot of money and can be difficult to convince uh, people in charge if it's necessary. But what we've managed to do here is provide a little extra height. So you will see that when we go to the pictures in a short while, there is a section that's, uh, it looks about 300 mil, but it is 275 uh, mil that will allow us to put another board in, should it be necessary in the future, to allow us to, to extend the height of the barrier. Although obviously that would require another flood risk activity permit, more consultation, more flood modeling. So uh, for now, it's not something that we'll be doing 
but it just made sense that whilst we had the equipment there and we had the ability to drive piles and we'd done the ground investigation that actually we took that opportunity so on to the next slide so this is just a an extract of the ea flood mapping which kind of gives you the appreciation for exactly where this site is so you've got the north uh, at the top of the page and then you've got the main line following the river x valley uh, and you can see stafford's bridge just underneath the the darker blue text there and then the main channels the main river channels are in the lighter blue color but uh, you get the the impression that this is a very wet area and also very susceptible so we'll just come through uh, to the next slide so with that context with the background that that i've described there you can appreciate that it was necessary to do a flood risk assessment uh, just to make sure that we weren't going to cause issues for others and in fact that was part of our project specification right from the start that we did a flood risk assessment and that was something that we were very keen to get right because otherwise the the next stage which is a flood risk activity permit which is what you need to get in place with the environment agency to do any works within eight meters of the main river in the uk uh, we, we really did need to get the flood modeling right and the flood risk assessment right so we managed to get that just in time um, it came through just before we needed to do the work so it was touch and go uh, and if i'm honest there were a few moments where i wasn't sure whether we were going to get it but um it did come through in the end so that, that was great news um right on to some pictures so i can uh, I can have a little rest now for a minute and uh, just give you the uh, the blue sky pictures here. So what we're looking at here is Cowley Bridge to the left. So you've got the A377 over bridge and we're looking here to the south. So back towards Exodus and David's. Um, as I've now taken on the gambit for access points, I did have to include an access point sign in there just for uh, just to make sure I covered off both sides of my role, drainage and line side. Um, but you can get the impression there that uh, the railway is definitely in a little bit of a cutting uh, on the downside. And then just off, you can uh, see the vegetation that leads down immediately into the River X. So that's what the site looked like before we turned up. So with every site that we do uh, in Western, it is critical uh, as with any construction project or civil engineering works that there is a, a substantial amount of site investigation done so for cowley one of the things we looked at first off was the drainage provision so clearly uh, with all that water hanging around and moving around when it's flooded there needs to be some way to dispose of that so there have been at points in the past various surface water drains laid down and you can just see here that this is our uh, asset stock so we've got some fairly new assets i think it would be fair to say some plastic pipes there some concrete chambers um, and what we've done is taken a cctv camera so this is one of our own uh, internal bits of equipment and we've surveyed the drain so i was very keen that actually when we did have the excess water in the, the junction area that we could drain it away adequately both for, for normal events but also for, for flood events as well so if we move on to the next slide you can just see here a very high level schematic of the drainage network that we've got so on this diagram we are orientated to the north um, with cowley bridge junction in the middle and then you've got the position of the demountable so the red line there across the middle is the demountable defence, which you'll get to see some pictures of in a second. And effectively, the network is split in two. So we've got a, a section to the south, which drains into the, the Environment Agency's flood defence scheme. And then we've got a section to the north, which drains into the River X via a highway culvert. So two networks there, and these are what provides us with drainage to the, the barrier location. 
because clearly we didn't want water to get stuck on either side of the barrier. Um, we're saying that the track gradient here falls from uh, the north through to the south. So the whole site is on a, a gradient of around about one in 396 coming from, from north to south. Just some examples of what we've captured with the CCTV camera. So these are internal shots uh, showing just what pipes we've got and what condition they're in. So fortunately, which was brilliant for us because uh, we, we didn't want to spend a great deal of money on uh, moving and upgrading assets that were already in situ, the pipes actually proved to be in really good condition. So you can see the perforations on the left and also the the uh, the pipe on the right there. So fortunately, very little silt and also very little distortion, which I guess probably is a function of the amount of water they carry during a high flow event. So that was really pleasing. And we'd also managed to find out where they all went, which was uh, a great relief. Just to uh, to demonstrate that it's not all reasonably new drainage, there is some old stuff. Uh, this is a 600 mil diameter brick and stone culvert. Uh, you can just see the outlet on the right. So this is original. This is dating to the construction of the line back in the early 1800s. Uh, still working, still flowing, and still doing its job. So uh, old, old is good. Old is definitely good although they, uh, they do have a habit of uh, developing defects at points, but definitely old is good. So we've talked a bit about site investigation there and the importance of understanding existing assets, uh, especially drainage for this site. But one of the things that we needed to do clearly is some proper ground investigation. So the site is in a river valley, so it's probably quite inevitable that we were going to find some relatively soft and very uh, very weak material, as Dick will uh, attest to previously. There have been uh, quite a lot of pockets of alluvium and quite uh, a depth of silt in places. So we had top drill uh, help us with the ground investigations. So we had some percussive rigs on site and we've managed to get down to just over six meters in depth here. So reading through the, the historic stuff, which was really fascinating. Actually, this is around about the same level that previously the works had got to with the, the, the past scheme, so the past flood defense works. So around about six meters, we hit something that was competent. So that then gave us the, the go ahead to design a uh, solution. This helped to inform the detailed design. And you can see there just highlighted the, the water strike. So we've got water at around about three meters below rail level here at Cowley. So there is, uh, there is certainly water in the, the subformation, um, although clearly the track is dry and the drainage system that we've got provides that positive drainage. So no track quality concerns, no formation concerns, but there is certainly water that we have to overcome if we were going to put anything in the ground, which is which is where we're going next in the, the presentation. So just some examples of the, the kind of material that we had here. So it's quite difficult to see, I appreciate, but starting at the top, you've got the ballast, you've then uh, moved into the, the clays and the alluvium. So you see the water at around about three meters there. And then you get down to some fairly competent mudstone and clay down towards the five and a half to six meters. So our piles ended up at just over six meters in length and uh, actually went in far more easily than uh, I was expecting. I was expecting something to be struck, but um, definitely they, they slid straight in, which was great. So. Ground investigation, site investigation uh, is always worth its weight in gold and you pay for it whether you specify it or not. So I just thought it was the best thing that we could do and it helped us to, to make all sorts of design decisions and we didn't have to make any assumptions, which was really, really helpful and actually gave confidence to EA, gave confidence to Devon County Council and all of our external stakeholders. So really really useful uh, 
flood risk assessment now is uh, what we're coming on to. So you can see here, this is product four information from the EA. So really helpful record and archive information. For those that are very eagle-eyed, you will spot the uh, inflatable aqua dams uh, on the railway. So not only are there, there two, there are three. So there's an orange uh, device uh, just to the south, sorry, just to the north of the railway bridge there. And you can appreciate where the high ground is now. So only thing that uh, the road network benefits here uh, from is that the, the A377 is slightly higher than the floodplain and also the A396 on the, the right. So we can still get access to the site during wet weather and flood conditions, which is brilliant. Uh, but yes, the flood risk assessment was clearly needed to, to make sure that we weren't impacting others. So I'm not going to pretend uh, that I know everything about flood modelling and flow modelling, but there was certainly a lot of work that was done by ACOM, and I've included some detail in here for those who are familiar. Um, but effectively, in summary, we've taken the Exeter City Flood Defence model that was produced by Jacobs uh, for the EA and uh, reviewed by ACOM, and we have then built on that. So we've extracted a smaller segment of the model because models are very, very large uh, and can take many, many, many days to, to run and to do simulations of. So we've taken a smaller part of the model and effectively trimmed uh, what we had already to then come up with a revised flood model for our uh, specific project area. So uh, I'm sorry that I don't have more uh, detailed knowledge on flood modelling, but um, it, it's definitely something that was done. It was definitely an important part of our process and it really did help to demonstrate the kind of impact that we would be having. So here is a couple of slides, or there are a couple of slides now that just demonstrate the areas of uh, deeper flooding and also velocity. So you can see here that the darker red colours are where we would likely uh, have quite high flow velocities, so 0.8 their meters per second and most of them fortunately are outside of the railway corridor but you can see very clearly that there are a number just above the railway here just literally at the junction where we have the flood relief culverts where we've got the new flood relief culverts so you can see why they have been put in to try and get water from uh, the x back water which is the, the back channel here, the old course of the River X, into the new River X channel. And obviously, if that water isn't diverted, and if it isn't stopped by the defence, then that is the stuff that ends up in the flood cell uh, to the south here of the railway line. And that is then what causes flooding to Exeter New Yard, um, the Riverside Yard, all of the properties here on, on Cowley Bridge Road. So really, demonstrating there that the flood modelling uh, has paid dividends and has allowed us to work out uh, what our scheme can deliver and the benefits. So another extract from the flood model, which takes a little while to get your head around, but uh, bear with it, it's worth it. So left hand side, we've got the, the condition before the barrier is installed. So the railway and the junction that we're talking about is just at the top of the page. Uh, I don't know whether you can see the cursor, but it's just at the top of the page here. And you can then see on the right hand side, we've got the proposed, which is effectively after our barrier has been fitted. So what you'll notice if you follow the railway line down uh, on the slide is that previously on the left, we have a very large area of flooding both to the railway but also to a smaller number of properties on Cowley Bridge Road and then post or uh, as part of our work you can see very clearly that all of the water in that flood cell has gone so uh, the scheme definitely had benefit for for many reasons not just for the railway but uh, the only other thing to point out here is the the purple line which is the Exeter City flood defense scheme 
So following that lineup, you can just appreciate how critical having something at Cowder Bridge was to stop water effectively bypassing the, the River X uh, defences and the, the EA scheme and coming effectively in the back door and coming right down into the railway corridor uh, and onto the railway. So following that and following that uh, extensive work, uh, it did feel like it would never end at some point, um, but definitely worth it. We managed to obtain a flood risk activity permit and I didn't realise until I was putting this presentation together uh, a couple of weeks ago that actually we managed to get the flood risk activity permit on Christmas Eve. So I don't know whether that was someone in the EA thinking that I'd have it as a Christmas present, but um, it was a nice Christmas present to get anyway. Um, so that was obtained. So that was Christmas 2020, uh, sorry, Christmas 2019. And then we move forward into delivery in the spring of 2020. So all systems were go. Um, but before we got to that point, uh, which uh, is a really vital part of the process, and especially so considering that I'm talking to a group of uh, permanent way engineers and those interested in permanent way, one of the things that we did have to do, uh, which was part of our deliverables, part of the work, was to do a track design just to understand what characteristics the existing railway infrastructure had and probably more critically uh, although it doesn't appear to be that much of an issue from the slides and from the photos shown so far actually the barrier is right in between the planing length between uh, sorry the uh, the toe to toes for two sets of snc so snc for the main line uh, has uh, shown on the left there and then you've got SNC for the Barnstable branch on the right so right in the middle of uh, SNC which is it's not the favorite place to put anything not least something that's novel and a little bit unique so there were a number of quite late night conversations with Steve Pearson the round track and also uh, many of his team Robin Emmons trying to get something that would work so it just gives you there a couple of facts and figures around the baseline. So looking at line speeds of no higher than 65 um, with a fairly shallow radius curve of 813 uh, metres, the minimum radius, which is on the down, which is the, the line on the lowest part of the diagram here. And just for context, so that we were able to see uh, the whole scheme together, we've got here what the, the flood defence barriers are stored in, which is a little a green fibreglass container, and then also the barrier location here. So we've taken effectively the crouch design, uh, the detailed design for the civils side of things, and we've then overlaid it with the permanent way design. So really important that, that we've considered all of those interdisciplinary issues. Uh, and there's a couple of examples of that a bit further on. So. This is just a, a zoomed up version of the previous uh, insert. So you can see we had to take uh, the measurements of each individual crib just to try and get this barrier in. So the pictures will make it very much clearer in a, in a moment, but effectively we've had to just squeeze a couple of the, the intervals between those sleepers to get this barrier in. So by uh, by our own admission, it's not something that we're normally able to do. It's not something that we've done previously, but it is certainly something that's, uh, that's proved successful uh, and hasn't really caused us a great deal of issue yet. And we hope that's the, uh, the case. So we are monitoring it. We are uh, making sure that we've kept an eye on the, the track geometry, the track quality, the formation, uh, because this is something quite novel. So these are a couple of really vital cross sections here so you can just see uh, the barrier at the very top so this is the item in red here this might be the larger item in red and then what you've effectively got across the track is a steel beam uh, forming a ground beam which is then tied together at six foot and cess uh, locations with these 
pile gaps. So we've got pile caps on top of the piles and then the ground beam effectively ties those together. So acting as one single beam, which then prevents the, the overturning moment because obviously there is uh, likely to be quite a lot of water on one side of the barrier. So effectively a retaining structure uh, for water. Right, I promised we'd get to some pictures. So this just gives you uh, an appreciation of the pile. So relatively small diameter piles, as I said, driven six metres into the, the underlying stratum. You can see here the sleepers that we had to drop out and uh, just move and fettle. So all put back and uh, obviously we'll clip back up for uh, the possession handback. But you can just see here that we've got some of the beam in situ. So there were initial thoughts around putting in a concrete ground beam, and putting it all across in one, which would clearly give more strength. But the only slight problem with that is that there isn't actually enough room to get it from uh, beyond the railway boundary or to twist it in to get it under the track. So that is why we've ended up with a, a modular system. And if I just scroll through to the next slide, you can see here that there are a number of mechanical bolted and uh, secured connections. And then from the previous slide, you can see that the central section here, so this forms a pile cap, has ended up in the six foot and we've got these securing studs here which are part of the holding down mechanism for the uprights so just uh, it gives you an appreciation of the ground beam construction and also how we've managed to get it to span all of the tracks and this this had the, the massive benefit of allowing us to do it in a staged way so some uh, some indications early on were that we need a blockade but actually, by doing it this way, we were able to do it in Saturday night possession. So all of these works were done over uh, four to six hours on Saturday nights. And we ended up having just over six possessions for the core work, uh, which was which was actually quite limited. Um, it sometimes feel a little bit tight for time, but uh, it's what we had. You can also see here that we've got the uh, different track construction type so on the up main here we've got base plated timber sleepers uh, whereas on the down main we've got f40s so that was all a challenge to uh, to come up get over and move the sleeper spacing slightly so you can see here that the width of the barrier has been uh, designed to fit in a crib but only just and uh, we had to, to clearly get some more ballast in there so some of these openings are a little bit more than I suspect that uh, some track engineers would like, but they really have uh, been minimised to make sure that we don't cause too many issues. And of course, quality control, keeping a tab, keeping a check on um, where we are with levels and uh, where we are with the layout was really critical. So I thought I'd better put a, a nice shot of the sunset in there just to show that uh, we did do it at night and it was uh, actually quite cold sometimes but um, it was really really vital that we kept a, an eye on the levels because as you can see from the pictures this really has been quite uh, an intricate uh, fit with the track the existing track so really important this just gives you an overview of the location uh, from the compound side of things so quite a small compound uh, and we've had the benefit here that we've managed to keep this in uh, post work so this is now a new access point which helps us both to deploy the barrier but also to actually get to this uh, site more generally so that's a, that's a good side benefit there now this this really gives uh, an appreciation of the the barrier itself and the ground beam so appreciate that it takes a little while to, to start reading this but effectively as I alluded to earlier we've got a number of piles that are then uh, capped and secured by the ground beam so effectively the whole system acts as one continuous ground beam and then we've got the the drop boards here which are these the boards shown above uh, with 
vertical columns then join up the, the different parts of the barrier. So you would appreciate one of the challenges here is the difference in cant on both the up and the down and also the fact that the tracks are not coplanar. So they look uh, very innocent in the pictures but that was probably one of the biggest issues we had was trying to work out how we could get the, the differences in cant and the differences in track height accounted for. So uh, overcome with both the ground beam being slightly different in elevation all the way across. So you can see it slopes from the upside here all the way across to the down. And you can also see that we've got the bottom boards here being of slightly different dimensions which uh, did prove challenging when we were trying to put it together at points to uh, to make sure that we had the right things labelled up and uh, you didn't put the down on the up line. But what we've done to minimise that risk is to keep these boards all of the same width so that the tracks are covered by boards that are 3.48 metres long and it's only the bottom boards that are actually slightly different. So uh, really, really vital part of the scheme. but probably one that took the longest to develop actually. So we are starting to get to the point now where you can see the scheme developing and you can see the, the infrastructure starting to be built. So this is the, the upstand and the upcess. So quite a bit of room here. We, we had to sadly knock down an old P-way hut, but I think it was probably on the way out anyway. So the P-way hut used to stand here. Um, it was pretty rotten, so not pretty good for reuse. But you can see that we've got this passive provision here that I talked about earlier. So our channels here are at that 15.58 metre level, but we've still got that extra height here. So if we did need to come back, we, we could certainly do that. Troughing interaction, we'll come on to in a minute, but that was also quite a critical uh, issue and quite a critical detail. So what we've got here is just some detail, a blow up of the interface between the sheet piles and the flood barrier. So a couple of steel angles that are welded. And then what I will show you is the actual, uh, the, the application. So we've got here sheet piles that are covered in uh, neoprene. We're not entirely sure we needed that, but we put it in as a bit of a safeguard. Um, so obviously there is intended to be a lot of water against this. So. We've got here the channel in the down cess and then a detail of the channel in the up cess. So secured into the wall on both sides and you can just see the securing pins here so that when it's deployed we can leave it in the, uh, the deployed position. To, to make sure that we do show that we uh, work in partnership because it's true we do uh, it's probably a bit of a surprise to some people, but we do. We uh, we like to work with the Environment Agency and uh, we have a member of staff, both uh, internally that works for EA and Network Rail. So it seemed only right that we had a, uh, a new junction sign made up. Uh, the old one was a little bit weather beaten and uh, it probably looked like it had been shot at a few times. So a new sign ended up going up, which was great. And then you've got here the storage box for the, the barrier itself. One thing I did uh, find out earlier is the signaling equipment and how critical it is to keep that dry and protected. And you can just see here that the raised lokes really help that. So all of our flood equipment has been raised up above the, uh, the level of the defence as well. So that, that helps to mitigate some of the issues. So dry side of the fence too. So when we're deploying this, we can stay dry. Uh, so if we need to build it in stages, even if we only get the bottom boards up, there's certainly an ability for us to uh, to stay dry when we're doing it. So the famous county bridge in, uh, now unfortunately not a pub, but um, we've got here the, 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 the actual box itself. You can see the new trough route that we had to put in. So that was a requirement for our s &T colleagues to make sure that they could put new cables in because as you'll see in a short while we have got a number of cables that come through the the barrier on both the up and the down side uh, and this is just a, a 
snapshot of what's in the, the barrier uh, itself. So the securing bolts, all of the, uh, the tools and equipment. I'm not sure how long the WD-40 will last, but um, it's certainly something that's useful. And then here we go, the barrier itself. So the, the famous Cowley Bridge barrier deployed and uh, in place. So in a trial, in a possession, so uh, no trains running at this point. But you can see here that uh, you've just about got the difference in level visible. And you can see that the bottom boards are most certainly not the same height. It doesn't help with the, uh, the barrier sign in place, but you can see here that there is definitely a difference in level. So really, really challenging uh, for fabrication and all sorts of design uh, issues. So it's good to get that bottomed out. Uh, I referred earlier a little bit to the, the cabling situation. So uh, what we ended up doing to make sure that the cable routes didn't act as a nice little drain was fill them up with a product called No Fur No. And I should never know whether I've said right or not, but it's effectively something that's used in the, the gas and electricity industry to seal up pipes and uh, orifices. So it looks really great on there, and that's how it uh, is used in the manufacturer's uh, mind. In reality, uh, it still works, but it's not quite as tidy. Um, so you can see here those little uh, orange grommet type things with the sealant in place. So this took probably as much time as the design itself to get this agreed with our signaling colleagues, um, making sure that the product wasn't going to degrade the cables, making sure that we didn't have water flowing through the barrier. Um, so this really was quite a key detail, although very small. Um, and then just, uh, I'm aware that uh, we need to, to wrap it up quite soon but um, just a couple of key details here so uh, the devil is definitely in the detail so these are the uh, typical cutouts for the rail so they are angled and flared in the direction of normal travel to make sure that it, if there is anything that gets stuck in the the interface area here it's not going to cause any kind of derailment um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions around that detail and uh, it is quite novel um, and when we've got the fence up there are some rubber packing pieces to go in here uh, so that's definitely in the uh, the non-deployed state in the deployed state there are some rubber bungs that end up in there uh, just to plug that hole and then on the, on the right hand side again another signaling interface issue so straight currents, wrong side failures, because this is a track circuited area, one of the really important details that uh, was nearly missed by the, uh, the construction team was these nylon shims, these inserts, so definitely detailed and uh, when I said if you put the nylon shims in uh, a few blank faces were uh, present so um, yeah they've definitely been fitted and uh, it will hopefully help to prevent straight currents and uh, also stop that risk of wrong side track circuit failures because clearly the beam is galvanized steel and uh, it's a very good conductor so the last thing we wanted it to do was short the rails and uh, to cause a wrong side track circuit failure so there's been a lot of thought around some of the, the smaller details which are hopefully going to see this barrier uh, successfully work for uh, a long time to come So just looking uh, overall at the scheme, uh, you can just see the B-Way hut there um, for those who are interested in the uh, the upsets. But this just gives an overview of the works mid-stage. Um, so the barriers in, uh, in terms of the ground beam and, and all of the pile cap, haven't quite finished the, uh, the fettling works here. So definitely still a bit more to do at that point. But uh, Really great to take that picture. That was very early on a, uh, a Saturday morning, uh, sorry, a Sunday morning, 7.33, I think it says at the top. Um, that was great. That was a really good good morning. Just handed back the track and uh, got to take a picture from the overbridge. So just finally, uh, I'm hoping there's some questions, but uh, it would 
be wrong of me not to acknowledge uh, all of the support, all of the input that uh, the individuals on the screen have given, uh, but there's also many others. And I think probably more importantly, uh, the input of Chris Stratton, who really did help the uh, scheme along and uh, kept everything going in the right direction with my assistance. So, um, yeah, thank you very much and uh, I'll happily take any questions. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, that was really interesting. Right. Have we got any? Um, we've had one one comment um, from somebody who's had to go just to say thank you very much for an excellent presentation. And he's never seen anything quite like this anywhere else on the network. That was from Aaron Silver. It's so, quite novel, Andy. Yes, it is. And uh, very good. So if, while we're getting some other questions in, um, I've got one. Um, you mentioned the issues around uh, ground investigation and, and how um, important that was. Is it? It was also the design intended that there would be no seepage underneath the uh, barrier at all. Uh, so no. So we always. I'm just trying to I'll scroll back to the slide. So uh, talking on the right thing. So there was always an acknowledgement that there was going to be some seepage. So. Uh, it's something that we discussed at quite some length, actually. So the ballast matrix itself doesn't lend uh, doesn't lend itself to being impermeable. So the top layer of ballast, the top 250, 300 mil, we've had to accept that that's actually just going to be uh, a little bit permeable and that during flood events we will get some water through it. Um, yep. So the only other thing that I can say, Andy, is that we did end up with a membrane, a neoprene, two sheets of neoprene that ended up going down from the bottom of the barrier, from the ground beam down into the, the ballast, so into the track support zone to about 500 mil depth. So it's an attempt to stop some of it. But as you can see from the, uh, the ground investigation uh, pictures here, actually quite a lot of the material is very cohesive anyway. Um, mm and is probably unlikely to allow a great deal of water through. Um, there will be some. So yeah, it's not 100% seal. So, uh, okay. So, so yeah. but obviously the, the quantity compared to what you potentially get through there is going to be very small, yeah. So, and, yeah. and your drainage scheme then d disposes of that back into the river uh, at some other point. Yeah, yeah. so, right. so still, still untested, Andy. Well, we well, I won't say we look forward to it because I, I, I hope I hope floods like that have become rarer. But um, but it will be tested in Jacob. Right, Paul Paul Ebert has said, can you repeat the detail of the bung arrangements around the rails, please? Of course. Just get to the relevant slide. So I think this probably shows the uh, the, the bung arrangement the best. So. You can just see here, Paul, that we've got uh, around each rail itself some rubber packers. So effectively, when the barrier is not in use, these are empty and they look like that there. So you've got an empty void, which allows the flange rays and the wheels to go uh, through unobstructed. But effectively, what we've had to do is they are very, very bespoke. Which is uh, which was a concern, I have to say, but they are only rubber, so actually they're quite easy to replicate. But they're effectively a uh, rubber that ends up being pushed when the barriers are pushed, and then uh, the rubber mallet that we've got wedges them into place so that there is that uh, better seal between the rail foot and the uh, the opening. Right. So right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Andrew Wilson asks, Mark, what comments from the P way about maintaining line and level? Uh, what comments? Lots of comments. So the, the local TME was consulted, so Malcolm Short for this area. Um, definitely involved. Steve Pearson was involved. Uh, Robin Emmons was involved. So we've got to look at uh, a number of things. So one of the first things we looked at was you won't be able to tamp this uh, particular crib. Um, but you will be able to tamp up to it. So it is definitely going to be an area that needs to be uh, monitored. So we've got an ongoing monitoring regime 
Um, it's obviously run on a four weekly basis here as well with PLPR, but it's the, the, the long and short of it is it's going to be more difficult to maintain than it would have been before. But it's one of those trade offs where actually uh, having the old Aquadams was quite a, a, a burden on Peeway resource and also didn't really particularly help the Peeway uh, in some respect because it, it allowed a lot of ballast to wash out. Whereas the new solution arguably uh, helps to reduce that. So it's a compromise. Uh, I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's perfect. Um, it is novel. It is something that we thought a great deal about. But uh, the other thing uh, to bring into that is that this junction is in for renewal in CP7. So one of the, the main reasons that we ended up uh, agreeing to disagree eventually is that we've got a period now of probably three to five years where we can monitor, we can see what the track quality is like, we can see what the formation uh, is like after we've done this work. And if it really does need to be redesigned and rethought, then we've got a chance to do that in CP7. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, Paul, Paul said, uh, thank you for the information about the wedges. They use something similar on the underground because mm. they have doors for preventing the underground. Ed right, Green says, what's the method for getting the traffic stopped and the barrier deployed? Does it start with an alert from the Met office to our route control or something similar? Yeah, so thanks Ed. So in terms of that, we get a flood alert from the Environment Agency, which is bespoke for the railway at County Bridge. So based on a number of flood gauges upstream, so we've got Trues Weir, uh, Exwick Weir, and also a site of Bolt Bridge now. So we've got a bespoke flood warning that effectively gets called through to the infrastructure control desk in Swindon. That then gets communicated to the local uh, on-call team. The on-call team then contact Exeter Panel, who are the, uh, the controlling signal box for the area. And effectively, an emergency line blockage is arranged uh, through control through a wire. And then once that's uh, taken, we've got the ability to deploy the barrier. Because obviously, uh, one of the things that we can't do is plan for a line closure because we have no idea when it's going to rain. So uh, that, that was one of the that was one of the quite interesting things about actually getting this solution up and running. That actually we don't know when this is going to happen. So we've got a standard operating procedure which is documented, which is briefed to the LOMS, to the signalers, to control, and it's in our on-call documentation now. So that that's the process effectively. EA notify Network Rail Control. And then we deploy uh, once we've got the the emergency line blockages granted for uh, for both lines. How 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 long does it take? You said it takes about forty five minutes to an hour to actually deploy the barrier. How long yep. does it take from sort of somebody firing the starting gun to getting the guys there and the barrier in place? So typically, so the the to answer that question, I'll, I'll go back a step. So typically, we typically get a six-hour notice from the environment agency with a high level of confidence. So we'll get a fifty-fifty at twelve hours out, and then we'll get a kind of you need to deploy at six hours. Um, so we've given ourselves a, a kind of response time of around about four hours to get right, people okay. there and to get people onto site. I mean, it's quite fortunate that it's. It's near a big uh, network rail depot, and uh, we've got, yeah, we've got on call people that are based out of Exeter in, in any case. So, uh, if not, it's uh, a two hour trip for me down to uh, down to Cowley and uh, Chris Stratton as well. Right. Okay. So it's it's it, but it's effectively we using the the flood level monitoring in the river. We get plenty of notice yeah. that, that we're likely to have a flood. Right, okay. Absolutely. Right. Steve, Steve Clark asks, he says, thanks. Very interesting presentation, Mark. Is this something that Rail are looking at to be used elsewhere? And I also feel that the solution for sealing the S&T ducting could be useful for other areas on the network where water ingress is a persistent prop issue. Uh, yeah. So to to answer that, there are uh, there were there, there are uh, there is another scheme that's proposed in New Haven. So 
uh, Chris, with his expertise, has uh, managed to, to, to multitask and uh, he's working with the Network Rail guys down in New Haven. So there is another barrier proposed like this. Clearly, there's not a great demand for them because there aren't many, many places that need them. But there is certainly a scheme in New Haven that's, uh, that's ongoing, not quite installed yet. So we managed to get ours in first. But uh, I think Chris said to me that the New Haven job is on a siding somewhere into a port. So not quite a main line. Uh, and yes, definitely that ceiling product uh, has much, much wider applicability than, than just this site. So uh, there are definitely sites that I could uh, think of that could benefit from it. So yeah, it, yeah it's product sorry. approved and it, and it could be used, but probably not everywhere because it obviously restricts the ability of uh, the cable uh, or for the cables to be replaced. So right. it, it does need to be thought about. So if Steve gets in touch with you, he can give you a bit more detail about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. OK. Right. Andrew Wilson asks, how many men to deploy the barrier and what sort of period is the railway likely to be closed in a flooding event? OK, so in terms of the personnel required, it can be deployed with a minimum of two people. So the boards are uh, such that they can be deployed and carried by two people. Um, it is right on the limit of what you can carry so uh, the the boards themselves are around about 25 kilos each so they're pretty comfortable for a, for, for a couple of people to lift the the heavier parts are the upright so they're around about 35 to 40 kilos so two people is a minimum um, but it's it's more uh, desirable to have probably three or four so not talking a great uh, labour force to deploy it. In terms of when it's actually deployed, how long would it stay up? Uh, I guess how long is a piece of string? I don't know. Uh, it depends on the weather event, it depends on the rainfall. Um, as I said earlier, that the one thing that it really helps us with is as soon as we get the, the notification that the threshold has been, uh, we, it's gone past the threshold and we can run trains again normally, that it's actually quite quick to take down. So uh, typically when we deployed the barrier in its previous guide, we've ended up having it for 12 to 16 hours typically, but it's, it's normally fallen on a weekend. So not been as critical to get it off. So we've kind of ended up with a get it open for Monday morning type scenario. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's probably the best I can answer on the, uh, the duration, I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm sure that's something that's going to be tested in due course, isn't it? Yeah. So. All right. Have, have we any more questions? Right. So if we've got no more questions now, um, I'd like to call upon Andrew Wilson to prevent, present a vote of thanks. Um, good evening, everybody. Good evening, Mark. And thank you for a, a most interesting talk about uh cowley bridge and its uh, environs uh yes an interesting uh site and i can remember the 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 effect in 2012 uh of the railway being flooded and it's not a nice thing to happen um and you can see these events coming and it's reassuring to know that perhaps uh, 12 to 16 hours will not necessarily impact on the railway too much um so um i'm relieved that you know train services down to south and west will not be uh terminated for too long uh, we've got a, f a fair number of uh drainage events that we've been reviewing this year for the pwi for the section uh, and yours at cowley bridges uh, certainly a, a big contrast to the works that uh, they've been doing on the Conway Valley line. And so as a comparison, it's been great to, to hear uh, what's happened at Cowley Bridge on a much, much more important and strategic line. So uh, on behalf of us all, um, I'd just like to say thank you once again and ask everybody if they could uh, perhaps open their mics and give a round of applause in the usual manner. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.
Right. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, and thank you for everyone for coming. Just before I bring proceedings to an end, to rem just a reminder. Um, so on the 10th of May, we've got uh, Brian Painter, MBE, who's going to give a talk entitled From YT YTS to MBE. Thank you all. So that should be really interesting. And that will be the last talk for this part of our um, season. OK, so are there any issues arising from the notes of the last meeting? No. OK. Right. Well, thank you. I declare the meeting closed. So I won't be rushing off. If anyone wants to stay for a chat afterwards, then uh, that's fine by me. OK, thank you. Cheers. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Oh. Right.